My talk is a little bit more straightforward than the last, uh, last talk. I really enjoyed it, by the way. Um, I really see the, the outcome of security a little bit more, a little bit more obvious. Um, but it's really about what, what path we take to, to get to that outcome, to get to that goal. And is that path a, a rugged path? So I'm going to talk about building security controls around attack models. So my name is Seven Chanette. Um, I run a company called Attack IQ. A uh, little background about me. I've been in security a little bit more than 15 years. Uh, started um, at a knock in a major university in Boston. Moved to the West Coast. Um, helped write one of the first vulnerability scanners called Retina. Then uh, went to WebSense, consulted. A lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different areas. But it's been mainly focused always in offensive and defensive techniques. So today, what I want to talk about is building security controls around attack models. And one of the main concepts around that is that continuous deployment should lead to continuous validation. Attack IQ, you know, we're, we're a startup that's been around for about three years, and DevOps has changed our life in terms of how easy it has been and how effective and efficient and reliable we can actually push code to AWS and, or other infrastructure. When we think of DevOps, we think about continuous deployment, infrastructure as code. Now, rugged DevOps has not been around as long. And the core goal of security within rugged DevOps is still and remains the same within security, which is reduce business risk. That is the outcome of security, no matter how you look at it. You're protecting the assets that run your business. That could be the reputation of your business, the people, the property, business operations. We have to remind ourselves that cybersecurity is a business issue, not an IT issue. And there's many teams involved. One of the wonderful things and the aspects of Rugged DevOps that's so important is that it's just not about the SOC teams, just not about the security team anymore. We're going to be interfacing with the, I, the IT, IT integrations team, operations team, developers. So if the goal is to reduce business risk, how do we do that? So the, some of the factors in risk are, what's the impact of a threat on my business, on a high value asset? What's the likelihood of that threat happening to that asset? When you're looking at the various assets in your organization, you have to wonder, well, what's at stake? And take measures to actually protect those assets. Protect the integrity, security, accuracy, the privacy of all those systems, that data, the people, the processes. Keep them running. So you're going to wrap security controls around those, those assets. And you do that because you have to, because of compliance. And you do that because you want to keep your business running. So in my experience, you know, 15 plus years, I worked on a lot of different products. And one of my opinions is that we've come to a stage now where we're buying too many solutions, too many products, too many controls are being put in place. In many cases, they're, made, they're, they're redundant. The manageability of all these controls has become overwhelming for a lot of teams. Now, obviously, DevOps helps an enormous amount in this area. From the rugged DevOps, I want to talk a little bit about how we can make this even more effective and efficient. So one of the questions that I think many of us ask ourselves as we run our security teams or operations team is, okay, I look at each one of these controls that is there for a purpose. I have an assumption as to why it's been purchased, why it's been deployed. Is it in fact doing what I think it should be doing? Continuous deployment of both the assets in your organization and the very security controls that are protecting those assets, there's a very important role in validating everything. As you're pushing dynamically all these assets and the controls, the policies, the configurations, are you actually validating them today? This is much more than a chef assert statement here. So why validate security controls? Well, you want to minimize risk. If you drive the impact down, the risk is minimized. The benefits of this is that you're going to be more effective and efficient in using and understanding these security controls, but you'll also consolidate a lot of these security controls. You'll actually understand the purpose. If there is no need, if they're not actually helping you to reduce the risk, you get rid of them. If you find something redundant, you get rid of it. If you find a gap, a blind spot, you can actually add. And you have data that's driven to actually understanding why you need a certain control in place. So how do you minimize threat impacts? And so I, I've spent a, a you know, majority of the last five years in tracking adversarial groups, techniques. And it all begins with truly understanding well, what's at risk? What's at stake? What are the high value assets? What are the typical and common attack techniques? Who are the attackers? Our industry is, 
is buying so much threat intelligence? How are we using it? Are we just putting it in place into these security controls and crossing our fingers and hoping that essentially the, the threat intelligence is helping us? Or are we actually validating that the security controls that we've put in place are the correct controls to combat the attack techniques that we're concerned about? So identifying the attackers, identifying the attack techniques, building up an adversarial playbook, building up the techniques, replaying that attacker playbook, analyzing the security controls. This is part of the continual validation that is necessary after continual deployment. So if you're analyzing the security results, you can actually improve, understand where your weak points are, understand where you essentially need to make changes. Now part of the manual process of this is, what are those tests? What are the techniques? That research is a manual process. Analyzing those results is a manual process. But the continual validation can be automated. Now if attack techniques is way past your organization, you know, we're not there yet. You know, we're just starting our security program. We just got you know, essentially into continuous deployment. We'd like to validate. You take a step back, and it's just about simply validating some of your controls, looking at the policy that you think is in place, your egress firewall ports, is that in fact I've just pushed out the new configuration policy. Are you then validating by exercising through some network traffic that those are in fact the, still the same egress ports in your finance department, in your engineering department? So it's, it's helped us become so much more effective in pushing out new code into the infrastructure through DevOps. But through the rugged DevOps process, are, they, are we then validating what's put in place is actually what we assume to be in place. So identifying those security controls assumptions, making a list of them, building security control unit test for every security control in place, exercising that unit test, analyzing the security control results, and improving if there is, in fact, a blind spot, a misconfiguration, a misunderstanding in your assumptions. You know, the, the philosophy of rugged DevOps is the fact that it's security is not just a point in time exercise. It's continual, as much as that can be true in your organization. If DevOps is code as infrastructure, rugged DevOps is code as security. Unit testing your security controls, as well as the assets and the applications. Regression testing your security infrastructure. If you look at an attack that you're concerned about, and it's got multiple stages, you start to understand the attack techniques. It's very important so that you can test each line of your defense in depth strategy and each security control in place. So the key focus in, in attack modeling is prioritizing some of the high risk assets in your organization. Prioritizing the adversarial objectives, the motives, most orgs are, are spending a lot of money on threat intelligence. Are you making the most out of that threat intelligence? How are you understanding, even if you're compromised and you put mitigation strategies in place and more security controls, what did you learn? What were those lessons? Those are exercises. That's intelligence that now can be applied to then reevaluating and validating on a continual basis the security controls in place. So once you understand some of the adversarial objectives, techniques that you're concerned with, you look at your security controls. How are they mapping together? You can start prioritizing those security controls in terms of the purpose, the functions, your assumptions. And then you start to create a process around the assumptions you have of the security controls, the adversarial techniques, and start automating a consistent test that can be replicated. Every single time a change is made to the infrastructure and that security control and any configuration and any policy is changed within that infrastructure, you validate. You validate it with your assumptions of that security control is supposed to stop X, Y, and Z. Well, X, Y, and Z become a security unit test. And maybe they're individual or maybe they're chained. So you can start unit testing security controls and you can also start regression testing a chain of security controls. So attack stages is an important aspect to look at. So there's a lot of different models from attack paths, attack trees, kill chains. Typical stages are attackers are going to look at external reconnaissance, initial breach, gaining persistence in your organization, escalating their privileges, moving around the network, access to other machines, 
establishing a command and control channel to communicate back to the adversarial source, and then exfiltrating data. So in attack modeling, you can look at each one of those aspects and say, okay, well, I have security controls that is supposed to stop a, a pass the hash attack in terms of lateral movement or use of uh, Mimi cats or exfiltration of data over uh, DNSA records or ICMP. Well, what do I have in place? You have assumptions because you've bought these security controls because you've essentially either through peer review, analyst reviews, but you had a concern in your organization, and those security controls have a purpose. So as you're reading about attacks in the news and you're trying to gain, well, I just read about a certain attack, how, do, how would that affect me? And you have security controls in place, this starts to be added into your repository. So both from internal knowledge of compromises that have happened in your organization and external compromises that would affect your organization. If you're a small CPA firm, you might not care about what's happening to a, a, a gaming company down the road and the attackers and the techniques that are be, being used. But as you gain more intelligence and understand some of the attack techniques and the models, you can start to apply those into unit tests that test your security controls. So the goal is to duplicate real attack techniques and tactics in an automated fashion and automatically test ex every expectation that you have to a fair degree against that asset or the security control that's wrapped around that asset as it's deployed. So here's a, an example. So the target breach. So you can look at stages, the initial breach, privilege escalation, persistence, access to other data storages, exfil, and you can start to break down what happened. So this might be a concern, might not be a concern. For every, you know, everyone's got their Sony breach or their target breach for their own industry that they look at as an example going, we've got to buy this software because, well, this happened to this other org. So the initial breach, it might be a, you know, a specific malware that was actually downloaded to a POS machine. There might be specific techniques that were used. So you break down a lot of the techniques. And a lot of this is open source intelligence gathering. If I'm not actually buying threat intel directly. And as you go through each one of the techniques, you start to understand, well, what's my detection capability? What's my prevention capability? <coughs> prevention might be a binary yes or no. I prevented it, I didn't. Detection might be a timely answer. Well, I detected it, but how long did it take to get noticed? And as you actually go through each of the controls that you have, you're looking at each of the attacker techniques and saying, okay, well, the installations of Citadel, well, we had, a, we had semantic. We had some type of AV solution. We never noticed the actual PHP web shell being installed. The use of PA or PS exec, that was st stopped by some adversarial uh, advanced endpoint. The notion of uh, an attacker sending files at 2 AM in the morning over FTP to, uh, you know, a server that was outside of the US, for our organization, well, that was different. So some type of behavioral analytics. So you look at actually what you have in terms of the technology that's in place for that security control. You look at the attack techniques, and you start to create these playbooks. These playbooks that can be replayed on an automated basis. And each one of these controls, as they're deployed, as changes are made, as configuration changes are made, as policies are changed, you can start to run through these playbooks and try to test each one, either through a unit test or a full regression test. So in this modeling exercise, installation of a web shell on a network, lateral movement, you know, past the hash techniques are used in about 80% of, uh, of, of, of most successful breaches as an attacker will move throughout a Windows environment, and then use of some kind of customized version of Mimikatz. So if that's the case, why aren't you testing your organization against that? Now this is way past just pure pen testing. This is looking at the security controls that you have in place and saying, well, how am I going to test those security controls? What are those, what's the capability of those security controls? Has that changed as I've done any kind of continual deployment? Has something changed in my environment? In one of my past uh, consulting engagements uh, before Attack IQ, I was essentially given a security control that was helping to protect and detect against Android malware. So sure, I could have looked at that technology and said, well, how can I find you know, some cross-site scripting in it, or if they're doing any you know, unencrypted communications out, and what can I gain? Can I find the key? But instead, what I'm looking at is the capabilities. 
So then I went through and I spent about six months and analyzed a lot of Android malware and said, okay, what are the capabilities of the attack techniques with this Android malware? Is it real simple? At what level are these attacks happening? And I truly understood the attack techniques. And then I went back to this defensive technology and I said, well, let's look at the capabilities of this defensive technology. Now, that was a very static exercise. I had a few months to do it, but in a dynamic environment where you're continuously deploying and you have these assumptions about those security controls and their capabilities, and then you have your concerns as to why those security controls are in place, are you testing those concerns? And are you testing them on a continual basis? So this really goes into a defense and debt metrics. I, I think that one of the huge things that can be gained by continuously validating after and, and integrating into the process of continuous deployment is that you start to identify percentage failures, percentage detection, percentage prevention. And you can start to look at historical metrics and start to identify, are you doing better? Are you doing worse? Is that control changing in some way? Is our ability or capability of actually defending against the attacks that we're concerned with changing? So this is an old proverb, trust and verify. So trust, but verify. So validate your security controls. So the SOC team is working with the dev teams, is working with the ops IT integrations team. They are all playing a part in this. The IT integrations team might be continuously pushing out new technology. The SOC team is constantly testing that technology. And there might be you know, different portions of that, red, you know, pure pen tests or red teamers, different portions of the SOC team that's doing that. Incident responders are actually you know, getting the alerts from those different controls. Developers are pushing applications that are wrapped around those controls. I think most organizations are doing a very manual job right now of unit testing their security controls or their regression controls or they're focused on the applications but not the security controls. The security controls and your potential lack of understanding the capability of the security controls is a huge weakness. And we have a huge opportunity in the rugged DevOps moment, movement to, to change that. So running routine attack models automatically as your apps, as your security controls are being deployed, identifying the gaps, identifying the blind spots, will allow you to potentially understand, did I have the right control in place? What are the weaknesses in that control? Versus what are your assumptions about the attack techniques? It doesn't take much time. It can be done at a very minimal level. It allows you to have data at the end of the day that given your potential or, you know, improvement or, or lack thereof of your detection or prevention capability. You build repositories of attacks. Most orgs are actually paying attention to what's happening within the other companies that are being compromised. Build that into your repository. It'll allow you to see historical improvements and say, well, yeah, that, that technology, that control that we did put in place, that actually helped us or it didn't help us at all. Because all of these controls mean that we have to manage more controls, more technologies. And we want to consolidate that. We want to run a very effective, efficient security control program so that when we're having conversations with the different business units, we're not worried about thousands of useless alerts, potential compromises that never happen. We actually have a very consolidated program. We understand the security controls, their capabilities. We understand the attack techniques. And we can communicate it effectively. So where to start? is getting the IT, ops, SOC, dev, management team involved. Build a threat intelligence attack repository. Move to using attack modeling to testing your security controls. Integrate this into your continual deployment. There's a lot of technologies to help you do this. And communicate the output clearly to show the improvements. It's actually an improvement that you found a gap. Because you're not essentially saying, well, we need this technology for this control, because Subjectively, I feel that this would be helpful. You have data to back that up. So if there's one, uh, one kind of phrase to, to kind of step away with is what can be measured can be improved. Uh, implementing security controls around relevant attack models will have you, help you have a better security program. It will be more effective, more efficient, and it will minimize the risk to your business organization, which is the goal, which is the outcome that we're trying to achieve. 
So security as code, continuous validation is incredibly important. Thank you very much.